the people whose jobs it is as professionals or as educators or as regulators uh, to go deep into the details of the workings of the financial system. Um, I'm guessing if you ask 100 of them, 95 would say we're far more resilient now than we were in 2007, dramatically so. Post-crisis, the Dodd-Frank Act does impose additional requirements, higher capital requirements for banks when they have these securities on their balance sheets, enormous fines to the banks for any mis-selling of mortgage products, skin in the game requirements that require the originators to keep a slice of these securitizations on their own balance sheets so that they have to eat whatever they feed to others. Uh, and these requirements um, were enough uh, to make the market a lot safer. It's not only that they have a lot more capital, there's a lot more transparency now. So in the derivatives markets, for example, uh, most of the off-exchange derivatives are now reported where regulators can see them. And uh, the standard derivatives are centrally cleared in clearinghouses where they're more safely risk managed in case someone, one of the largest um, uh, derivatives traders were to fail, those positions would be managed by a clearinghouse rather than causing immediate contagion into the rest of the financial system. The banks are much better capitalized now than they were before the crisis, dramatically so. And yet, when they get credit from wholesale bond investors, the bond investors are asking for much higher compensation in yield for bearing the risk of default losses. Now, how do you square those two facts? First, the banks are much safer, much less likely to fail. And secondly, bond investors are requiring much more compensation for bearing losses associated with bank failure. There's only one reasonable explanation in my mind, and that's the perception by investors that were a large US bank to get into trouble in the future, the government is not going to bail them out. The government is not going to make those bonds whole. The difference between the likelihood that big banks got bailed out before the financial crisis versus the likelihood that they will get bailed out in the future is dramatic. It's a significant reduction in the probability of bailout that's implied by those market prices. Imagine a very large bank on death's door, or maybe it's just getting undercapitalized, and the government has lost patience with the managers of the bank and has become concerned that the bank may fail and cause problems for the economy. Now, regulators have on their dashboard a big red button called bail-in. If they hit that button, then the bank will go through a failure resolution process by which overnight the debts of the bank are eliminated, a large fraction of them are eliminated, and the creditors that were owed those debts are no longer creditors to the bank, they are now shareholders in the bank. And they, therefore, will suffer the losses that the taxpayers might have otherwise suffered. That process is called bail-in. And of course, there are, it's a complicated process, and it's being implemented in different ways in different countries. But in the United States, it's taken quite seriously by bond investors. That's one of the reasons that they no longer believe in too big to fail, is that they know that that red button is sitting on the desk of the regulators waiting to be hit when the time comes and uh, that the plans for this failure resolution have been fairly methodically worked out. The 
the day on, uh, in, in which we say, okay, the system is great and um, let's just keep it going the way it is, that, that day is still far off. But in terms of the U.S. financial system collapsing because of a shock like the one that occurred in 2007, it'll happen someday, but it's not going to happen nearly as frequently as, um, as it would have um, uh, given the situation that we faced before the financial crisis.